Hello and welcome to the CAPE training program. My name is John Leatherman. This is the third and final video of the introduction. CAPE is short for Community Assessment and Education to Promote Behavioral Health Planning and Evaluation. This training and related activities was sponsored by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the USDA Network of Regional Rural Development Centers. The objectives of the program are first, to enhance behavioral health literacy. Secondly, to motivate the creation of community coalitions to address local behavioral health needs, such as those related to the opioid epidemic. Finally, we are encouraging the notion of formal action planning to create a community roadmap for improving the local situation. In this video, we provide additional information about the CAPE community mobilization and action planning process. I'll also present a sample plan for creating and sustaining a community mental health coalition. If you have ever organized and managed a major community initiative, you know it can be a challenge. First, you have to get all of the necessary people on board and involved. Then you have to get everyone in agreement about priorities. You've got to get everyone to work. You have to keep people motivated and involved for the long term. Over the years, I've done this dozens of times, mostly in relation to community economic development and community health. I can start with a dynamic and compelling show. Everyone is excited and motivated. Then, six months later, everything is petered out and nothing is being done. I found myself wondering whether I've done any good at all. Getting an entire community from point A to point B isn't easy. Many things can be done to keep a project on track and to make progress. We'll talk about them in the course of this training. But there is one thing I have concluded is important above all else to increase the probability of achieving a successful outcome. To increase the probability of achieving community goals, you need a plan. A plan creates a roadmap for you and other community members. A plan anticipates resources needed and potential obstacles. A plan creates benchmarks to show you are making progress. Planning of this sort is actually familiar to most of us who work for the Cooperative Extension Service. We call it extension program planning. The notion is that for a major program initiative, you lay out a two or a three year strategy for what we need to do to accomplish a goal. Frequently, it follows a planning process many of us know as a logic model. Developing a logic model is both easy and hard. It's easier to be lazy and not want to think that hard, but time and again, seeing little progress in the communities I work I concluded there is no substitute for having a plan. Not my plan, the community's plan. For the past 10 or 15 years, when I go into a community to work, I make them go through this planning process. If I teach a community economic analysis program or conduct a community health needs assessment, I'm not done until program participants have completed a logic model for how they will proceed after I've gone. This is the classic logic model template that you are likely already familiar with. We use the logic model template to create a community action planning worksheet. This worksheet walks you through most elements of a logic model. I simply broke the logic model into its component parts to make it easier to think through all of the elements of an action plan. To be fair, there is more to a logic model than is represented in this worksheet. But I found the worksheet to be accessible to just about everyone, including those who have never undertaken, undertaken a planning exercise like this before. A copy of this template is available on the CAPE website. It has three major parts. First, it asks that you think about the big picture of what you are tra trying to change. You then identify the most important priorities for making it happen. Second, it asks you to think through the details of how you will achieve those priorities. Finally, it asks to establish some benchmarks for measuring progress in achieving the goal. The first section asks questions about the current situation that needs to change and what are the most important things to do in order to achieve that change. 
The second section asks for the details, the resources and activities needed, and who needs to do what. Finally, it asks you to think about measuring progress in the near term, intermediate term, and long term. For our purposes with this CAPE training program, I'm going to focus on two things. I'm going to ask that you consider going through the same process on behalf of the communities you serve. The first is to develop an action plan to create and sustain a community coalition to address behavioral health challenges. This would only be necessary if such a coalition doesn't already exist. We believe such a local coalition is necessary to tackle a problem as big as opioid abuse. If you already have and work with such a coalition, you can move straight to the second challenge. That is to create a community action plan to address opioid abuse. Of course, you can choose some other focus if you feel it more appropriate for your communities. It may be suicide prevention or teen bullying or something else. Regardless, these sorts of problems won't go away and won't get any better without some sort of a coordinated effort. I've created a sample action plan for you that applies to the notion of creating and sustaining a, a community coalition to address behavioral health. You can adapt this for your own community if such a coalition is needed. This is a completed action plan that I created for my home community. It is available on the CAPE website. I live in Manhattan, Kansas, located in Riley County. We have a coalition called the Riley County Mental Health Task Force. I patterned this based on what they are already doing. I'm not going to take the time to walk through this, but encourage you to read it and to adapt it to your own situation. If your community does not have a group like this, I strongly recommend that this be your first priority for your opioid response action plan. Does this type of collaboration make a difference? I've had the opportunity to work with Riley County Mental Health Task Force on a couple of projects. In the past four years, this is what I've seen them accomplish. The Riley County Police Department and the local hospital have established monitoring programs to see how big a problem mental health encounters are in the community. The Community Mental Health Agency is collaborating with the Riley County Police Department in a co-responder program where trained mental health professionals work with police on patrol and in the jail. The Mental Health Center has secured the resources to create a crisis intervention center as an alternative to taking people to the hospital ER or the county jail. The police department has formally embraced a law, enforce, a law enforcement initiative called Crisis Intervention Team. They have committed to undergoing training and are setting up a council to oversee the department's activities. And our local district court is considering setting up a drug court to work with people who have relatively minor skirmishes involving drug activity to get them help instead of just locking them up. Once again, by the end of the training, we want to encourage you to complete one or two planning exercises to create a local coalition if one does not exist and or devise intervention strategies to address opioid abuse. We are going to ask you to share your work with the CAPE team. We are trying to build a case to demonstrate that community capacity building of the sort common to extension programming is an effective strategy for responding to this crisis. We want to promote the idea that extension and other outreach providers are potentially important providers who should be at the table helping solve community problems. We've offered this training in five states and and may do so in as many as a dozen more. So we're going to ask you to share your work with us at the end. From here, we'll visit in a webinar. We'll, we'll try to answer any questions you may have. If you're on board, you'll then participate in the mental health first aid training. Then we'll meet again to talk about your thoughts and impressions. Here's our contact information. Thank you for watching.